Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs analyzes how a short supply of cattle is affecting prices. Alastair Stewart updates us on planting progress in Brazil. Keith Gluen explains why harvest is a good time to consider on-farm research. And Corey Walters talks about commodity markets and index funds. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. Data from the USDA show beef prices rose again to new highs in the month of September. All fresh retail beef jumped nearly a dollar from September 2013's mark to $5.92 per pound. Ground beef last month was $4.10 per pound, about 60 cents more expensive than a year ago. Thankfully for the farmer or rancher buying and selling very pricey animals, the nation's farmers are currently harvesting record large crops of corn and soybeans, which can be used as feed sources. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and asked about the continued increase in cattle prices during the month of October. Pretty amazing. Just, I don't think anybody ever thought anything like this could happen. It's been, it's been very good for profitability. Yeah, you know, we keep talking about how it's been able to hold up this long, but it's not only holding up, it's increasing. It is, and it's just because your supply of cattle are going to continue to go down until you get past the first part of the year. November is always a tough time to find fat cattle anyway, and this year it's just exacerbated by the rest of the situation that we're in. So are you planning any differently into the future to, uh, I guess, plan for extended high prices or continued high prices? That's a really good question. The, the last cattle on feed, the September cattle on feed, we saw placements equal with and actually a little bit above last year, which is the first time we've seen that four, five, six months. I haven't go, I'd have to go back and look, but so at some point, and typically your October placements are pretty good too. So at some point in the future, you should have similar to last year's numbers when it comes to slaughter. And you got to kind of wonder what that's going to do to prices. So I think a guy's got to be real careful in just assuming that, well, high prices are high now, they're going to be high in the future. I, I don't know. I know you thought that the, the supply of cattle would be tight in the fourth quarter this year, first quarter next year. You still hold that, though? Well, I think fourth quarter, definitely. First quarter next year, I don't know, because you've seen these slaughter, these, these placements come up. Not all these placements are calves. Some of these are going to be yearlings, and that's when they're going to be ready is at Jan Feb time. And beef demand typically is very poor then. So if you have, you know, similar to or maybe a little bit greater slaughter receipts and you have poor demand, that's not exactly a great combination. Tell me about the resiliency of the customer right now. Absolutely amazing that we have not derailed ourselves because competing meats are cheap, especially chicken. I think chicken's almost free. And <laughs> yet, People like beef, They've, we've established that, it's a, and it's a great product. We've done a good job improving on the product, and thankfully customers like it and are willing to pay for it. I don't know at what point they're going to say no, but they haven't yet. Is that it? Is it this, is just the strength of the product purely that's been able to, to keep this up? It has to be. I mean, because if, if a consumer doesn't want to pay for something, they just flat won't, and they're willing to pay these increased prices. Have we hit a harvest low in corn, do you think? I don't believe so because harvest is so is so slow. If you would have had this big, huge, fast push, I think we would have just crushed the corn market. But since it's just kind of been working its way through, it hasn't done that yet, I think the farmer's going to fill every last bit of his on-home storage. And then when we get to the end of the crop and this, there's still a bunch out there, then that's finally going to be where they sell it 
and that's what's finally going to pressure the market. I, I don't believe we have gotten to that point. We've had a little up in the corn market here, and I think if a guy want, wants, needs to sell something, he probably needs to get it done because I think eventually it's going to roll right back over. Falling to what price would make you really start to drool? <laughs> Anything under, you know. Realistically think, now. Well, I know. I think the low is like 318. You know, I just don't know that we can take the board under three. But even if you get it down to three and you have a 40 cent under basis, that's pretty favorable cost of gains. Yeah. So we're be, be in good shape. You look at some of the uh, reports that Packers are losing money. Uh, first of all, do you think they're losing that much money? And second of all, do they have to in order to just buy the short supply of cattle that's out there? It's a great question. We're having a lot of trouble anymore. There's absolutely no correlation between box beef price and, and their profitability because they have so many value add products and we don't know what goes to export. I just can't think they're doing as bad as they'd like to make you believe because of their aggressiveness for cattle. But that is due in part to they don't want to lose market share. If you're if Swift has a customer, whether grocery store, grocery store ABC, if if they go to Swift and Swift doesn't have any meat because they've cut their hours back because they didn't buy any cattle, they're going to go to Tyson, and and Swift won't get them back. And so that's why you've seen this competition out here. These guys do not want to lose market share. So they just keep paying up to get the cattle on because it's a really small supply. Now your question is, well then, why do they keep doing it if they're losing money? Because they'll lose that customer and that customer is apparently still able to sell that beef at these prices, so there's still demand out there. So it's a wonderful situation if you have cattle on feed. Well, it looks like, it looks like it's not tough to find them. Is that accurate? September and October, you can usually, the availability is pretty good. The availability is starting to get extremely tight extremely tight and I think it's just going to be more so because you always get a dead zone here because these guys that want a background or hold their cattle to the first of the year. What, what's going to be interesting to see how many, what are our receipts in January versus what they typically are and I, if that number's down then you're going to see high cattle prices for quite a while. What about margins per head? Margins per head keeps getting smaller because we're really smart in the cattle industry. We drive all the margin out of our feeder cattle because that's what we do. There's still, still a lot of competition to cover feed bunk space, so we drive these things up and profitability's been good. The thing that scares me is, as I'm buying it, your deferred markets are as much as $20 cheaper than it is right now. And to just assume that the deferreds are going to come up there, I don't think I want to make that assumption. Next week, Roy Smith will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets ahead of the USDA's November crop report. After dramatically scaling up planting acres this spring, U.S. farmers are now in the midst of a record-breaking soybean harvest. The USDA is expecting the country's growers to produce more than 3.9 billion bushels of beans. While the projections last year showed a dance back and forth between Brazil and the U.S. as the world's largest soybean grower, the estimated 107 million metric tons of U.S. soybeans this year blows out even the largest projection from this season's crop in Brazil. But that doesn't mean what happens there won't affect prices in the United States. Alastair Stewart writes as DTN South America correspondent in Argentina and Brazil, where farmers are just beginning their growing season. We talked with Alastair Tuesday from Sao Paulo to discuss how Brazil's presidential election will impact ag, whether the Argentine government will force its farmers to sell their soybeans, and to get an update on planting progress in Brazil. Most of the footage you'll see was taken during our visit to those two countries in January. Planting has been got off to a very slow start in Brazil. Um, normally, um, planting starts in the second half of September. Unfortunately, the spring rains have been very late coming. Um, a month and a half later, we've still only got 16% of the Brazilian soybean crop in the ground. Um, that's compared to 34% of the same point last year. Um, the, that's the bad news. The good news is that um, since, since about the middle of last week, it started raining again in the key regions of the center west, which includes Mato Grosso, the number one producing state. And as of the weekend, people have started planting at an accelerated pace. So um, over the next week or so, we should see a big jump in the uh, planting figure. What are the estimates for total soybean production within Brazil? Um, despite the poor prices that we're seeing this year, um, the, the most analysts expect Brazil to increase area by up to 5%. 
and production to increase between five, five to ten percent. Um, the kind of the range of estimates is between about 91 and 96 million tons. Where's that increase coming from? Is it more land? Is it better yield? It's a little bit of better yield. Um, some parts of some parts of the grain belt suffered from dry weather last year. There's a little bit of um, switching from corn to soy area. Um, obviously, um, corn margins are, are, are much worse than soybean margins here in a place that doesn't have as good a uh, corn um, yields as the U.S. Um, there's also um, some expansion into new areas, which is a reflection of kind of planned expansion a couple of years ago. People a couple of years ago decided let's expand on good prices, and this area is now coming into production. And in Argentina, what are the estimates for soybean production there? Um, well, the area is expected to grow a couple of percent to something by around 50, 51 million acres. Um, and production is expected to grow similar, in a, a similar degree, 2 to 3 percent to about 55 million metric tons. On Sunday, so, Brazil re-elected its president, Dilma Rousseff. Is this how the agricultural industry wanted this to end up? Um, no, no. Broadly speaking, agribusiness supported the opposition candidate, Ayasio Neves, who is, the, who is viewed as more business friendly. Um, um, the victory, uh, Dilma Rousseff's victory, is seen as a bit of a disaster for the sugar and ethanol industry. Um, Rousseff has a policy of capping fuel prices, which has squeezed margins on ethanol and has helped tip the sector into a mini crisis over the last couple of years. For the grain sector, Rousseff's re-election is, is not such a big problem. Um, under Rousseff's Workers' Party, official credit has grown massively, uh, and she is committed to infrastructure projects that are key, key to improving the sector's competitivity. Um, so, yeah, you know, obviously, the, uh, Rousseff has something of a reputation as an interventionist. Um, you know, there's, she's, she's been setting a lot of prices in the area of electricity, and um, increasing regulation in areas like mining. But the thing, uh, soy probably will escape for that for the simple reason that soy exports are now absolutely vital to the trade balance that is slipping deep into the red. There's also some tension, uh, continued tension in Argentina. Uh, how many soybeans are left in that country, first of all, from last year's crop? And second of all, is there a threat that the government will come get them? Yeah, that's the question on the minds that's exercising the minds of many Argentine farmers. Um, it's very difficult to tell exactly how many how many soybeans farmers hold. Um, I, my, on a recent visit there, I heard estimates of about 30% of the crop still in Argentine farmers' hands. And you, you, uh, the, uh, you have to bear in mind that they've only sold 15% 50, of the coming crop as well, or committed to sell. So. Basically, they're, they're hoarding as many soy, uh, soybeans as possible. The, the industry is, is very stressed by this new supply law that was announced um, last month, which um, gives the government powers to actually um, confiscate um, stocks, um, food-related stocks in extreme circumstances. Um, farmers are extremely nervous about that. Um, from what I've been hearing, it seems unlikely that they will actually. Um, this will be applied to farms. What it seems to be more, it seems to be, have passed to increase pressure on the the trading companies, the exporters, and so forth to actually get rid of their stocks, actually sell on their stocks. So, not it will obviously have a direct impact on supply, on world supply, but not on the Argentine farmer per se. Is what I've been hearing. I want to end with this question. As you look at Argentina and Brazil, Argentina will hold its presidential election in a year. Is agriculture gaining a bigger power or a bigger influence in both of those two countries? Yes, definitely, definitely. In Argentina, it, it, um, um, grain and agriculture has always, always been very um, important, as in Brazil, but grain production has now become extremely important because is a vital source of um, foreign currency. Um, you know, um, soybeans, I believe, account for about 30% of, of, of foreign income now, um, or rather government income um, in dollars. So 
it is very important. At the same time, um, the Argentine government have kind of realized that um, farmers will always plant and uh, they, they rather exploit that <laughs> by, the, um, by the fact that uh, they realize that if, a, if the tax is 10% or 35%, farmers will plant anyway. And so they've kind of been ramp ramping up the export taxes and so forth over recent years to, to try and maximize their revenues from this sector. Um, agriculture in Brazil is uh, has always been important. Um, it's you know it's basically was founded as a as a commodities exporter. The grain industry has become much more important over the last two decades, and the farm lobby is starting to become more um, influential. It's still not very, it's not very coordinated yet, and so so nothing on the level of the U.S. But its importance is growing certainly. You can keep up with Argentina and Brazil during the growing season by reading Alistair's work on DTN. You can also view more of our coverage from South America by visiting the MJ Extras tab on our website, which features our interviews and reporting towards the beginning of soybean harvest in South America during January. Nebraska farmers had harvested 87% of their soybeans as of the latest USDA Progress report. They were also 40% complete with their corn harvest. UNL Extension educator Keith Gluen says harvest is a good time to think about doing research on your farm during the next growing season. There's a lot of time in that combine that we can think about next year. And, uh, you know, we like to think of the, the big ticket items. Um, did I get a payback, for example, on the extra nitrogen that I applied this year? Or did that starter fertilizer formula payback and, and the fungicide application? And the list goes on and on. So. Uh, as we think about next year and down the road, we need to, um, you know, try to answer those questions using good scientific uh, methods. And one way of doing that is conducting on-farm research through the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network. It, it doesn't take that much time because we're going to use their own equipment. We're not talking about small plots. We're, we're talking about their own farming equipment and, and field length uh, strips. and. Um, all they need to do is to contact an educator in Nebraska, go to our website to find out, first of all, the educators involved in the project, uh, and we'd be more than happy to uh, schedule a time to either talk to them on the phone or, or have a one-to-one -one visit about uh, how they go about uh, laying out this, uh, uh, this research in their fields and capturing the results. You can find more information about the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network online at cropwatch.unl.edu slash farmresearch. The project is sponsored by UNL Extension, the Nebraska Corn Board, the Nebraska Corn Growers Association, and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Maintaining ranch profitability and protecting natural resources go hand-in-hand -hand on the Pelster Ranch near Erickson. Dwayne Pelster is featured on the cover of the November Nebraska Farmer explaining the long-standing tradition of strong conservation on the ranch he and his wife Nancy operate. The Pelsters were honored recently with the Nebraska Leopold Conservation Award, sponsored by the Sand County Foundation, the Nebraska Cattlemen, and Cargill. You can learn more about their stewardship traditions and ranch management in the November Nebraska Farmer. As we mentioned in our previous episode, the Cornusker Economics Outlook meetings will be taking place in mid-November across Nebraska. This week, Corey Walters joins us to look at commodity markets and commodity index funds, a topic he'll be covering briefly at those meetings. Corey says the users of commodity futures have evolved over time to include index traders in the early 1990s, a portion that currently represents 11% of the soybean market and 20% of the corn market. We talked with Corey here on East Campus Wednesday to discuss why the players in commodity markets are important. As, as time has progressed, you know, these, these players have evolved and we got kind of a, a new group that's come around in the last, uh, say, 20 years or so. Um, we have our traditional hedgers, uh, you know, the commercial traders uh, who touch the physical commodity and are looking for uh, to hedge price risk. You also have your, uh, your speculators, you know, your non-commercials there who are there to uh, uh, capture a return from trading commodities. And then you also have this, this new group coming over from uh, the stock market called index traders. So the index traders, like I said, are this, this new group. They've evolved, they've, they've grown, and, and so in 2007, the CFTC uh, acknowledged their existence by breaking them out in, in their reports. Essentially, it took them out of the commercial and non-commercial categories to best 
you know, give transparency to the market of who these, who these players are. These index um, traders are who then? Are, so you essentially have essentially swap dealers um, who are looking to uh, uh, hedge their risk that they've taken by another you know, over-the-counter transaction. Essentially, you could sell corn to someone or for next number of years, and then you would hedge that risk by going on to the futures market yourself. And you also have speculators in there that would be just uh, uh, large pools of capital that would be looking to diversify into commodities to be, put more eggs in more baskets. Let's talk about specific commodities, soybeans first. Where do they play in soybeans? So an, an index trader in soybeans, um, in commodities in general, are you know they're they're a passive group. They run by by very uh, strict uh, uh, rules in their prospectus, um, and they are essentially long only to the most part. And as you see on the graph, um, you know it's it's typically long only with a small small group of of shorts. They same same what, in corn. They hold what percentage of or what percentage of traders would they be? So right now, um, they're, they're essentially getting pushed out of the market a little bit as a, a percentage of market share because we're having more speculators come in, but we're sitting right now at 11% at uh, in the soybean market as commodity index traders, and for corn, that number is 20%. You now you look at stuff like this and you wonder, why are, why are they necessary? Why do they exist? They want to capture returns in, in commodity markets, right? <laughs> Anytime you have uh, uh, variability in price, right, there's a chance to, uh, uh, to capture a return. Um, they may be also looking to hedge their risks from, uh, um, you know, real big events, you know, financial crisis, other things to where, you know, if equities go down, um, maybe, maybe the uh, uh, commodity prices would go up. So they've hedged themselves there. And also there's an inflation component to, to them as well. The Cornusker Economics Outlook meetings will be held at five locations in Nebraska starting November 17th. For more information, you can contact local UNL Extension offices or visit agecon.unl.edu slash CEO. Next week, Kate Brooks will join us to look at the outlook in livestock. And now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. During this past week, the only major precipitation that was reported across the state was in that Sunday afternoon through Monday morning time frame, primarily impacting the western one-third of the state. And from the western one-third of the state, the greatest, uh, greatest amount of moisture reported was across the Panhandle and the western half of the Sand Hills region. And generally, totals were in the quarter of an inch with a few isolated spots around a half an inch. And then we had a few sp scattered showers break out in east central and southeast Nebraska Thursday evening into, into Friday morning as we had a warm front lifting across the state. But that system is expected, was expected to generate some fairly significant snow accumulations, lake effect at, at that, across northern Michigan as it started to draw some very cold air in, and that will continue throughout this weekend. For us, we have one system to deal with during this next week, and that will be coming in on Monday, which will bring in some cooler air with just a light chance for some scattered precipitation, nothing major. The heavy precipitation stays to our south. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this will play out. First of all, here's that ridge in place, the trough of the cold air that's bringing the snowfall to the east of us. And then in the west, we have another trough moving in that will be our player in our forecast as we get into Monday. This is expected to bring some heavy precipitation to uh, Washington, Oregon, and the northern one-third of California totals anywhere from two upwards of five inches of moisture with this system as it moves eastward. Very good news for a drought-stricken area that's been dealing off and on with some very significant drought for the better part of the last couple of years. It's going to take numerous of these events for us to erase that drought. We don't expect to see much in the way of significant erasure of this drought, but this is a second system in a series of systems over the past couple of weeks that are starting to bring moisture to the region, so this may be more of a positive outlook for the western United States in terms of drought relief if we continue to see this pattern develop over the next couple of months. Now as we go into tomorrow, we're going to notice that trough starting to make its way toward the east. So our high pressure system is going to drop toward the southeast. It's going to bring some warmer area into southeastern Nebraska. In the same token, some cool air is going to start falling into the northwest. So the cold front starts to make its way into the northwest corner of the state during the afternoon hours and the early evening hours. And then that is expected to pass through the state during the overnight hours and leave Nebraska in the cool air with the warmer air to our south. So here we go on tomorrow morning. You can see the main energy to the south of us. This is where the greatest amount of precipitation is going to fall from the Panhandle northeastward up through northwest Missouri within this zone, looking at one to possibly three inches of precipitation. But for Nebraska proper, from the southeast part of the state where we're looking at a tenth to a quarter of an inch, and this would be the external southeastern corner, 
dropping off to virtually nothing as you get northwest of I-80 in the Lincoln area. Now as we go into Tuesday, this system starts to shift toward the east. We get a high pressure system from the west trying to build in. That's going to give us some northwest flow aloft. So some cool air invades the region, particularly in northeastern Nebraska. And warm air starts to build in across the western part of the state. And that will start to expand toward the east, but it's going to be held up a day as this system comes out of Canada, starts to move toward the south and emerges up with this trough to generate a fairly robust area of low pressure across the eastern Corn Belt and of course bring some heavy precipitation. By the time we get to Thursday, you can see the system really winds itself up. We see this ridge trying to build in, so we're kind of caught in the confluence zone between the very warm air to our southwest and the cold air to our northeast, so the coolest temperature will be in northeast Nebraska. And then on Friday, we start to see the ridge taking more of a hold across the central plains and the cold air starts to shift off toward our east. So if we look at the temperature forecast. We are looking at 70s out west this weekend with 50s up in northeast Nebraska, cooling into the 50s and 40s this early next week with that system coming through and then a gradual warming trend as the week progresses. The 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday indicates that we will still be dealing with above normal temperatures and in terms of precipitation, the heaviest precipitation is expected across the northern boundary of Canada. Uh, and, and the United States into our east. And then if we look at the three-month forecast, and this basically is our winter forecast, cool to our, our south, warm to our north, and in terms of precipitation, wet to our south, dry to our east and our northwest, and really no trend is defined here in Nebraska. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, soybean planting in Brazil, commodity market participants, and on-farm research. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following our feeds on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next week, Roy Smith will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.